Hello. <laughs> is this Joel? This is Joel and Trey. Joel and Trey. Hi, Joel. Hi. How you doing? Yeah. <laughs> this is Becky Dufo calling from Satellite Orbit. Hi. Hi. I'm her husband, Terry. How are you? My Good. husband, Good. Terry, on the other phone there. Interviews with stand-ups are always very interesting. <laughs> We're sitting. <laughs> okay. How you doing? Good. Okay, we'd like to tell you, first of all, we're real, uh, real fans of the show. We enjoy it. We watch it every weekend. Wow, thank you. It's a real treat. I'll tell you, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, a friend of mine and I used to do like the very same thing back in my uh, early days. We used to set with a Super 8 film and just uh, totally rip apart me uh, Metropolitan and all that, you know. Metropolis? Yeah, Metropolis. That's what it is. Uh-huh. And yeah, uh, it's based on life. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to find out about how you got started. Now, the first time we saw you was on Saturday Night Live, and uh, you were doing comedy magic. Is that basically how you got started? or? Um, you mean doing my stand-up or Mystery Science Theater? No, you were doing your stand-up, and you was doing comedy magic, much like Harry Anderson. Uh-huh. And uh, could you tell us about when you got started doing that? Doing stand-up? Doing stand-up and also appearing on Saturday Night Live. Oh, that was in the 80s. Uh-huh. In the early 80s. And uh, used to do that and um, got into doing this. Okay, and uh, what was it that wanted uh, that made you want to become a stand-up comedian? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Gilbert Gottfried said it was because he couldn't do anything else. What do you think? Oh, I don't know. I don't do stand-up anymore. You don't do that at all anymore, huh? Mystery Science Theater. Uh-huh. Okay, on the show, how did you first meet everybody that you're involved with in the show? Were they old school buddies of yours, or was it just a uh, group that you got together for the show, or how did that come apart? Well, Jim Mallon, who's the producer of the show, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, approached me, and he wanted to do a local comedy show in Minneapolis. And uh, I had this idea for a show, and he liked it. <coughs> And Kevin and him, who does Tom Servo, already had been doing a lot of local TV doing uh, parodies and stuff on this little um, independent TV channel, Channel 23. Mm -hmm. And Trace and I were in a writing group, and uh, we were about to do the show, and I knew Trace. I liked the kind <laughs> of stuff that Trace was doing in the writing group, and so I invited him, and then he became Crow. Okay. And Dr. Clayton Forrester. What was it that influenced you? Were you a science fiction fan? Uh, yeah, yeah, not deep, you know, uh -huh. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm yeah. not over the edge with it, I don't go to the conventions. Is there any particular favorites you might have enjoyed uh, in a TV or movie line in that genre? Uh, well, I liked anything that was about fantasy, mm -hmm. fantasy stuff I like, it's fun. What about the character name of Robinson for Joe Robinson? Was that perhaps influenced by Lost in Space because they were Robinsons also? Or? Right, right. Yeah, I, I got that right away. I thought that was really funny because every time you think of somebody stranded in space, it's the first thing that hits your head is Robinson. <laughs> right, yeah, that's what it's from. Because I looked like him when I was a little kid. <laughs> really? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> do you think that uh, MST will achieve, or do you want it to achieve, the cult following that usually comes along with shows like this, such as uh, Star Trek or whatever? And I'm putting you in a good comparison there. I think it's already got a cult follower, uh, following. Uh -huh. uh, we've got, what, 5,000 fans? 7,000 wow. 7, fans in the fan club. Great. We're, we're one of those. Yes. Well, thanks. Or we're two one of those. Of them. Two of those, excuse two me. Two of those. We're two of those. As well as that, Joel, we have also got in waiting right now a subscription to your Mystery Science Theater. Comedy when you, Central. Comedy Central when you guys scramble in December. And it has been in, in holding for, for six months. Yeah, just for your show. What, what's that? Okay. I don't understand. Okay, uh, Joel Lyons didn't understand this either. You folks are going to be scrambling in December. Because we have a satellite okay? dish. We have a satellite dish, so we pull you in direct, okay? We don't go through a cable company. And in December, you guys are going to be doing what they call scrambling, which means <coughs> any satellite dish owner has to subscribe to the network in order to receive your show. And oh, we, have to, we have to pay for that subscription. Yeah. 
We've had that in holding for six and months. I didn't want to miss the show. And we've had it in holding for six months, so we wouldn't miss Mystery Science Theater. <laughs> well, that's great. <laughs> Amongst your audience, uh, particularly people that you have contact with through the fan club, and that, what ages do you seem to attract? All ages. All ages. So it's adults and kids and everybody, huh? Yeah. Do you think of your show as, as more of a kiddie type of show or, or an adult show, or is it one that just expands all, all ages? Well, I think it's, I really, we don't direct it at anybody. Uh -huh. We just do what we think is funny, and um, it, 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 I, I don't really know, to me it's really not, I mean, maybe it's me, but I don't really think of it as a kiddie show like yeah. Huey's Playhouse or something. I don't either. It's, it's real different. It's it's for everybody. It's like something, you know, it's like if we were putting on a show for, I don't know, a group of people that were all different ages, we'd do Mystery Science Theater. Yeah. When you so think... We don't really direct it. Um, I guess when we started, we assumed that it would be like college kids and yes. video files and people that were really into bad movies. Mm-hmm. But it turned out to be a lot broader than that. Do you think this is something that's popular because of it being the 90s and there being a big cult following and, and uh, people watching things that are corny and are bad, which are so bad they're good? Do you think it would be as popular as if it was on, let's say, in the uh, 50s or 60s? No, it wouldn't have worked then. I think the reason why, one of the reasons why it works is that people are so saturated with so many choices in TV and movies and they have a a lot of savvy, savvy, um, as far as that goes, that it's a show that, it's the first show that kind of starts turning on itself and making fun of what's mm -hmm. going on. So it's, I think one of the reasons it works is because there's so many choices that it, you know, it wouldn't be on NBC in 1961. Yeah. Do you think it's something that works best on cable? Uh, works best on TV. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, when you presented your show for sale, is Comedy Central, when you went on a broad basis of going national, is Comedy Central, which it was under another name at that time, uh, several names in fact, uh, were they the first ones that you offered it to? Yeah. And did you have them in mind? I mean, did you sit down and say, hey, this place is an up-and-coming network and it's going to be great? What no, did you have in mind? We, I knew some of the people that were working on it. Mm-hmm. It was just an uh, an in that we had, and so we tried it. Okay. And one thing that's very unusual about yourselves is is uh, you maintain your own production facilities. Is that right? Yeah. That's kind of unusual. Do you think that that uh, works out quite as well as if you were in the big old New York or Hollywood area? Oh, it's a lot better. Uh huh. It's just great because we. Uh, there's no pressure, you know. It's like yeah. we can take as long as we want to shoot the show and. Uh, uh, and as long as we want to build props and put them in the space, and there's just not that craziness as on the coast when you're doing a production. It's a lot, we lead a real good life. We get in at 9.30 and we're often done by 5.30. Now that's your very own building or are you in a local TV station somewhere? It's our own building. Great. And of all the people that uh, works there, a lot of them has many different hats, too, don't they? I mean, in the credits, you can see that, that one person will do three or four different things. Do you think that works out real well? Or is that by choice? Or Well, there are a lot of people that do a lot of different things, have a lot of different talents. And mm -hmm. when we started, we were pretty small. And uh, there weren't a lot of people to do all the different things. And it's kind of fun to get to... Uh, be able to work on like a set one day and write the next day and yeah and who built the robots um, I built them uh, at first and uh, and then we all kind of it's kind of like everybody each puppeteer maintains their puppet Trace uh, added a lot of the stuff on Crow and uh, Kevin maintains Tom Servo and Jim maintains Gypsy so it's kind of each guy does his own thing now. And how did the idea for the robots come about? Uh, one of them appears to be uh, manufactured out of a gumball machine. Is that right? Uh huh. And the other one, what would that be? Like sports equipment or? Yeah. yeah. Um, servo. Well, it's just uh, 
they're just collages of uh, of stuff, uh -huh. plastic stuff, and uh, uh, they don't really follow a theme. It's just it's just a bunch of junk that looks good together. <laughs> Are they the uh, hand puppet type, or are they like animatronic, electronic, or uh, how are they operated? Those are rod puppets. Okay, much like the Muppets. Um, kind of. There's, there's not a. The operator's hand doesn't go inside the puppet. They're uh, operated by uh, rods and cables from outside the puppet. Uh huh. Who am I talking to here? I'm talking to two different people. Uh, I'm Trace. Oh, great. Okay, glad to have you on here. I wasn't aware you were on here. Okay. And uh, how do you pro pronounce your last name? Is it Baloo or...? Yeah, that'll do. Okay. When you were doing the shows, uh, is there a lot of outtakes? Uh, you mean stuff that we couldn't show? On yeah, the that you had to cut out. Yeah. Um, there's some. What was the funniest thing that ever happened that wasn't planned? Hmm. Boy, that's a hard question. Yeah, it is. We had a guy die on the set. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing really uh, unusual. We, uh, you know, it's our job. Yeah. We, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's what we do. You know, it's kind of like coming to work every day, and we really like it. It's fun. Yeah, you can see that. It definitely comes across. You guys are definitely having a good time. Yeah, we, uh, I think uh, we have to live with each other, so we're not too nutty. Yeah. We have to be with each other every day, so we, we've learned to, we save the nuttiness when, on our off time sometimes. Well, you have to have a good attitude living in Minnesota because it's beautiful, but you tend to freeze there, too. I know that for a fact. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you, Joel, um, how did you come up with the MTS theme? Yeah. Was it, uh, has it ever appeared on recording, or will it ever be available? Or have you ever recorded or written other music? Um, I only did that, I kind of, I'm not a musician. I did it um, with a guy who was a really good musician, and I just kind of had a few ideas, and he reiterated them. Now all the music's done by Mike and Kevin. Mike is our head writer, and Kevin runs Tom Servo. They do pretty much all the music. Mm -hmm. And as far as uh, releasing it, I think we're doing a um, Christmas tape, a Christmas uh, videotape with all our songs on it. Is that something to be available through your club then, or? Uh, yeah. Great. In some of the episodes, Tom Servo has appeared with his gumball type round head, and in some episodes he had like a square type head. Can you explain now what that was all about? That's a uh, Servo sport head. Okay. Uh, I think in one of those episodes, uh, Joel was giving Servo a haircut, and that's what he he had trimmed him down to that sleek sport head, and he'll he brings that back every now and then. It really really brought my attention out. I was sitting there one day and I said, "Wow, what's that?" <laughs> Is there ever going to be any uh, introduction of new robots on the show, or are you basically going to stick with what you've got there? I uh, you never know. It it could happen. Keep watching. If someone uh, was never aware of the show, had never watched it before, or uh, somebody came over, let's say, from uh, Japan or something, and was being told about the show, how would you describe the show? What is the show? How would you describe it? To a foreign person? Well, to a foreign person or to a person that's never seen the show. It's just a really great show, and watch it. Um... I'd say it's about a guy who's trapped in space who is forced to watch bad movies. I mean, we have to describe it to a lot of people because a lot of people don't get the comedy channel. Yeah. Yeah. So I find that I say it's about a guy who's trapped in outer space and they make him watch really bad movies and you can see the silhouette along the bottom of the screen and we make fun of the movies. Speaking, uh, speaking on the terms of the silhouette on the bottom of the screen, uh, Joel, how exactly is that done? Uh, it's a thing called a, uh, a chroma key, is that right? Yeah. Chroma. Okay, yeah, I know what that is. It's much like your blue screen type effect. Yeah, that's what it is exactly. Yeah. It's just like they use on the news when they show images. Very, I mean, it's real old technology. Yeah. And then we're sitting against a big blue wall and we're watching monitors at our feet. And that's how we can tell what's going on in the movie. And we also have scripts with the time codes so we know what lines to say. 
Well, that's kind of neat that you guys actually, you know, watch the films rather than just uh, having someone take notes or, or something for you. I know for a fact uh, Gilbert and Rhonda have up all night. Gilbert does watch movies, but Rhonda doesn't. And it, it's good that you watch the films. You evidently must like them also, huh? Uh, Some yeah, of them. It, that's a really fun part of the show is watching the movies. and make, It's probably my favorite part of the show, make, watching the movies and making fun of them. We enjoy it. <coughs> Was there ever a movie that you had that uh, defied making comments about it? That you just couldn't really think of anything to say about this movie and you said, well... Trace or whatever, let's forget this film. It's no good. We can't use it. Uh, we reject a lot of films um, in the selection process. We go through about, well, for every 10, we get maybe one that's even suitable. Mm -hmm. um, but once we've decided on them, uh, we've, we've screened them to make sure they're suitable for what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, uh, what is it that you do in that process as far as choosing them? How, what is it that... Uh, the criteria. Yeah, what is it that uh, allows you to say, well, that's a good movie? Uh, oh, what, what are the things you look for? Good, uh, recognizable, has-been movie stars, mm -hmm. people whose careers were once bright and promising and now they've just augured in. Um, then, then it's kind of up to whether we can get the rights to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We select them, we like them, and then they tell us we can't get them. Yeah. I heard uh, on an interview on Comedy Central that Joel did with uh, Alan Havey that when you guys strive for your film packages, a lot of times you will ask just for the really uh, rotten ones, you know, the really bad movies. And uh, that comes as a surprise a lot of times to the packagers. Is that right? Um. Well, it's unusual uh, because <clears throat> usually what happens is the people who package the movies, they'll take 13 good movies yeah. and package them with 13 bad movies, and we tend to want the 13 bad movies. Yeah. So it just gets confusing for them uh, because they want us to be paying for the good movies and we can't use the good movies. Mm -hmm. Can you name some of the movies that you particularly liked, both of you there? Rocket Ship XM. Oh, that's a classic. <laughs> uh, Ring of Terror. What was that Ator movie we did? Ator the Fighting Eagle. Uh, yeah, he he's flying in a giant furry uh, hang glider at one <laughs> point. Yeah, um, I like the Amazing Colossal Man. Uh. I was really surprised to see the Sam Arkoff movies on your show, like Amazing Colossal Man and so forth. Because while they're all bad movies, those are really the cream of the crop. And they were really good, you know what I'm saying? I mean, they were real classics. Yeah. Um, they're not something you'd find in a public domain bin, in other words, what I'm saying, you know. Yeah, um, it's just, it's funny to us, too, because we could get them. Yeah. We, apparently the demand is not high for those movies, and we were able to afford the, the lease on them. Uh-huh. So it's like nobody... Uh, we were there, we were very surprised to get those too because you'd think people were really into uh, those things, but they were they were affordable to us, so we got them. Hey, you're going into your fourth season now, is that right? Or yeah, next year. Uh huh. And when will the uh, first season show start for the fourth season? Yep. About when will they start for the fourth season, the first show? Uh, I don't know when they'll start airing. We'll start producing them like mid January. Mm hmm. And this idea that you guys had for making comments for the films, is this something that you guys did uh, at a younger age at your friend's house or something like I, I told you earlier that I did a long time ago? Oh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, it's a great day when a kid realizes it's okay to talk back to the TV. It's fun. <laughs> Someday it'll be interactive TV. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I think that... I think that's why the show is so popular because yeah. everybody identifies with that. Everybody has done it and everyone will, as long as there's TV, there'll be people talking back to the TV. Do you and Trace ever find yourself at a friend's house and they're showing a film or something's on that everybody's really interested in and you guys let out with a comment and they're saying like, be quiet or something, we want to hear our show, you know? Oh yeah, I get called on that a lot, <laughs> mostly from my wife. <laughs> Leave your work at home, or leave your work at work. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Joel? Um, 
I guess, I don't know. I, I, uh, I guess so. I, I'm um, not when it's a group, though, because you're kind of, it's what we do. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, if you do it for a living, you don't want to do it in real life. It tends to be, you know. But when I'm at home, I, I can do it. I mean, one thing I've learned is I've gotten a lot better at it uh -huh. uh, over the years than when I started. When we started, we had to improv the show. We didn't we didn't do it on tape. Well, we we didn't practice it like we do now. And I was Trace was a little bit ahead of me because he had done improv. But so I kind of started at the beginning. I I didn't really wasn't really very good at it. Mm -hmm. So um, are you married, Jill? No. No, okay. Uh, but I have a girlfriend, and uh, we. Uh, so as far as your question goes, I guess I'm. I can do it, <clears throat> and sometimes I think people expect me to do it, and so that makes me not want to do it. <laughs> yeah, because at times that people may possibly expect you to do it. When you go over to a friend's house and they turn on a film or something, do you sort of feel pressure or, or set there with a fear of, uh, well, they're going to ask me to do something? Yeah. Because there's one thing a comedian hates is somebody expects them to be funny when they're out grocery shopping or something like that, you know. Yeah, I just tend to tell people I'm not funny in real life, and that takes the pressure off. Uh-huh. I wanted to find out one question that really interests me. Uh, especially since you had mentioned that you would probably and do attract video files and, and real diehard sci-fi fans and all that. Has there ever been anybody that has ever complained that you were altering a film with your voice or with your image, such as people's complaint about colorization and so forth? Yeah, we've had some negative reaction. Um, even back at TV23, we had people calling in and we'd be showing really terrible movies and they'd complain that we were talking through them. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's a small percentage. Yeah. Most people just like what we're doing. I'd say one in 2,000 letters is negative. Do you think it has such a uh, low number of complaint because of the type of movies they are? I think if people don't like it, they turn the channel. Oh, absolutely. I've always believed that, yeah. Yeah, so it's a, it's a strange person that's going to not like something and then care enough to complain about it, take the time to write a letter. So you tend to discount them anyway. Would you ever... We do get criticized by our fans, though, and they're usually pretty good ideas. Yeah. Would you ever dare or be brave enough to do what you do to something that's really loved like King Kong or, or Gone with the Wind. I know Gone with the Wind is not something that falls in your genre, but uh, would you ever do a classic, real classic? Well, we have our own favorite movies that, you know, we'll, we'll see them as screeners, but we uh, will like them and we won't want to do them because we, we still, you know, hold them in esteem. Mm-hmm. But there's some movies that we wouldn't mind taking a swing at. Yeah. What about, that's even though this is probably... The about it is getting the rights to those movies that are classics, because when it's a classic, everybody wants to see it, yeah. and we can only do films that we can afford to uh, lease. Of so, the things that would never come about because you couldn't get a license to do it, yeah, or right. because you don't do... Maybe someday we'll uh, <coughs> be able to do that, and maybe we will, but... Yeah. Um, I, uh, the nature of our show is really about drawing attention to movies that aren't good. Yeah. You know, it's really about that. It's not that we're, <coughs> we just bring, we find crummy old movies and show them to people and make fun of them. And they're usually, we like to find movies that people aren't going to see every day. Yes. Let me ask you this, of films that you do not have in your package right now. Uh, could you tell me some that you would really love to do someday that you haven't been able to? Or is that like kind of jumping the gun here? Well, we're kind of restricted because we, it's kind of like uh, the reality of getting certain films is hard. We would really like to do some uh, Irwin Allen stuff. I think that's kind of unanimous that we, <coughs> he had great movies, they're real cheese ball. They got lots of celebrities in them, and they um, they got a lot of goofy action in them. So, so you're talking like about the disaster type of film, right? Yeah. Right. 
Do you think that would uh, set well with your sci-fi fans? Would that fall in with your uh, image that you're projecting there? Well, we've done every kind of movie on our show. We've done beach party movies. We've done teen exploitation movies, uh, biker movies, uh, Japanese monster movies, horror movies. So we've run the gamut. Yeah. It, it isn't a science fiction show. Mm -hmm. Has any of the stars in the movies ever contacted you? Uh, yeah, you Miles O'Keefe called uh, Joel, and uh, I don't know if you saw that one, the Ator film. Yes. Miles O'Keefe uh, from the <laughs> Bo Derek Tarzan movie. <laughs> yes. Uh, he called up, and also his co-star from that film called. Well, and what was said? Oh, they really liked it. Was he glad you was making fun of it, or is it something that, uh, one of those films that he would rather forget, or... No, it was it was really nice. He said, "I've been I've been trying to come up with the same kind of thing myself," and uh, he he seemed to really like it. He invited us to come out and see him when we got out to L.A. Hmm. <coughs> um, Are you going to? Oh, I don't know. Possible. Yeah, it'd be fun. Um, but we uh, it'd be fun to go work out with Miles. Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes. But um. <laughs> We, um, it's really been nice. People overall really understand that what we're doing is is fun, and uh, we're not too hard on people. We, I think we could be a lot worse on people. I mean, there are a lot of other comics that are a lot more harsh on people. Mm -hmm. Joan Rivers, for one. You know, we're we're fond of these movies, and we're mostly making fun of the worldview that the guy who made the movie had. Mm -hmm. We're making fun of the director and the choices he made, and the, we're kind of making fun of uh, the white male reality of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And so people understand that, and it, 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 I think that's one reason why people like it is they, they know, they get a feeling that it's good. It would be a great possibility someday that uh, if any of these stars in these films could drop in as a guest, too. Yeah. That would be interesting. Yeah, Miles agreed to do that for us. Mm -hmm. At the end of the show in the credits, there's a phrase, keep circulating the tape. Does that have a special meaning? Um, we're just encouraging our fans to, uh, if they're taping them, to uh, send them to friends who don't have the channel yet. Mm -hmm. um, that started, I think, uh, even back in at 23, people were taping it on their own and sending it out to California to friends and to New York. Um, it's like, you know, when you guys get your satellite descrambled, mm -hmm. you'll have access. But there are a lot of people out there who still don't get the show. Yes. Well, I'll tell you, your show's been very popular, uh, especially the satellite dish owners. It's been unscrambled for a year, and of course, you know, with costs and everything, I can understand how they have to wind up getting their subscription fees. But there's been a lot of good comments about it because uh, it's a good show. I think it's on a very good network. Wow, thanks. Why do you think your show has lasted on that particular network when a lot of the show hosts on, uh, let's say, the Comedy Channel or Comedy Central, whatever name it was in at the time, did not last, such as Tommy Sledge and, and so forth like that? They didn't quite make it. And your show did. Your show was there right from the beginning, and it's lasted. Why do you think so? Well, we don't host clips. Uh-huh. We are a separate entity. We did it all ourselves, you know. We um, we didn't have a lot of intrusion, and so we just did one thing and tried to do it as good as we could, and it seems to have worked. And you're not on local TV anymore, is that right? Minnesota there? Right. You can get it. In, it's on cable in Minnesota. Uh-huh. And uh, when you decided to go network, did you just up and tell the station Minnesota, well, we're going on uh, Network National now, uh, or was that a situation to where the show was already going to be going off of the local channel? Yeah, we were off the channel long before we moved to the comedy channel. Uh-huh. And that, you said that station's from Minnesota? I mean, uh, uh, main, Minneapolis, the main city there? Or? Right. Okay. What can be expected for future shows? Is there anything that uh, could be surprising to people to hear about what's up and coming? Uh, there's a Turkey Day special coming up on Thanksgiving, uh, 30 hours of Mystery Science Theater. Seriously? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. 
I love marathons. I love marathons. Yeah, it should be something. It's going to be wonderful. How many shows have you guys produced already? Uh, it'll be 50 at Christmas time. We're probably at, we're, uh, I don't know, 40 something. Must be 42. And do you sign contract for one season at a time, or how does that work? I mean, I believe we have an agree. I'm, I don't really know. Yeah, for 80 shows. Yeah. Is that right? Something like that. It's like we made an agreement for 80 shows. Mm-hmm. So we'll have 30 after Christmas. Okay. We'll be making this show for the next two years. Well, that, that sounds very promising. <laughs> Let me tell you, that, that's nothing hey, to worry about. It's great having steady work. Hey, you know it. Let me ask you about when Michael Fuchs showed up. What was that like? Chairman for HBO. It was really nice. It, uh, it, it was fun to have him come out and kind of uh, give his benediction. And uh, Were you nervous? Um, yeah, sure. Somebody like that, you're always afraid you're going to trip and break their arms or something, <laughs> you know, fall all over them or blind them. I'm always afraid I'm going to accidentally blind them and that would be really bad. Uh, but that's the problem. Yeah. He, he, it's kind of like, it was just great because we knew that that was going to be meaningful to a lot of people. Uh, just it's good for business. What's he like? I know you probably want to tell me he's this really great guy and everything, but what's he truly like? Um, well, he's a guy who really works hard and he's yeah. really into work. And uh. so he, um, you know, he's he's a he's a big shot, so, and uh, he's uh, you know he <coughs> was really nice to us, and uh, he seemed to really enjoy being here. But, you know, he is, a, like, you know, he's, he's like, really powerful in the business, so you kind of, like, go, you kind of, you don't really treat him like, I don't think you, you treat him like you would just anybody. Mm -hmm. I think you kind of, people tend to be a little bit guarded around him. Did he ever mention to you someday uh, having the show produced out in New York, or is this something that you've told him that you would want to stay in Minnesota there? No, it'll always be done here. Mm -hmm. Is I don't think he cares. Yeah. Well, as long as he gets the same high quality he's been getting, you know. Yeah, he doesn't care. It's better. It's better the way we do it. I think that that they really they found that that works better than doing it in New York or L.A. because we have a different point of view. And you're all born and raised in Minnesota, is that right? Uh, the Midwest. Uh, Mike and Kevin come from Chicago. Uh, I'm from Wisconsin. Uh, Paul, our new writer, is from Chicago. Frank's from New York. Trace is from here, and Jim's from here. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about the MSD fan club and some of the things that you offer. How did this come about and uh, so forth like that? Uh, how the fan club come about? Yeah. Um, well, we wanted to offer... Uh, quality merchandise, I, I don't know. We, we started, we had a, a phone number when we were at the little TV station, uh, a number that people could call, and that just got swamped with calls. Uh -huh. So then we went to uh, putting the address on the screen for people to write in, and that, that was a wonderful thing to get response from people and drawings from kids and drawings from adults and things, and uh, it just grew from that. Uh, we offered a, uh, a membership card when we were at the, the TV station, and that was real popular. Um, in fact, uh, Jeff Maynard, our, our prop master, uh, has a card. He was a big fan of the show when we were on locally here, and, and now he has a job here with us. Oh, great. Wow. Fans turn That's into great. employees. That's great. But it, it's been real successful, the fan club. We've got 7,000 people in it. I got a real kick out of your uh, flyer for your products because as well as your products, you have the phony ads for the uh, products like was advertising the old comic books and that. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that was... Uh, your giant balloon and your monsters. And Trace did that. That's great. That was a direct ripoff of all those uh, comic book ads we knew as kids. Yes. I don't imagine any of these companies are in business anymore, are they? Uh, that I think that was like from a 1952 Mutt and Jeff comic book. <laughs> okay. Oh, <whoa. laughs> this is still up and running. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> and out of the fan club kit, probably the thing I got the uh, biggest kick out of was a little silhouette you taped at the bottom of your screen and, of course, a high-quality robot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Let me, let me ask you, Joel, speaking of the silhouette that you have in your fan club, do you make them certain sizes by chance for those that have a 55-inch big screen TV? Uh, oh, you mean the, uh, the home viewing simulator? Yeah. yeah she's making a joke here. <laughs> she's making a, a comment that looks kind of small on our big set here. Oh, I see. I've yeah. got a 55-inch screen. Yeah, we, we, we tried to make it as adjustable as we could. <laughs> You can always use your Xerox machine. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to find out, too, here, uh, as I said, it is available to satellite dish owners, and it really sounds to me like you guys really want everybody to see the show to where that you are asking people to even circulate tapes and so forth. What's your feelings about satellite dish owners uh, getting the program? Because we are Satellite Dish Magazine as well as to uh, cable people. Can I get some feelings on that? Oh, we think it's great. We... We are, uh, we're fond of uh, however people, you know, we just like it. Once we provide the show to the Comedy Central, you know, I'm sure maybe they have an opinion on it, but we don't. We just like it when people watch the show. Mm -hmm. We're into technology. We like all kinds. Especially since where Joel is broadcasting from is called a satellite of love. I felt it fits in real well, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because it's sort of like speaking to that technology. Yeah, that's really true. Mm -hmm. um, actually, that that's kind of uh, that really fits in. You're right. I hadn't thought of that, but it does. Yeah, and uh, you don't do stand up at all anymore. Why is that, Joel? I uh, just I just been busy with the show. Okay. I'm start doing it again. And yeah. also, a lot of uh, writers want to write about that, and I kind of am tired of talking about it. That's yeah, I can understand that kind of steered it away to talk about the show. Let me, let me ask That's you. a long time ago. Yeah. Let me ask you, Joel, um, being a movie host yourself, okay, um, with, with Mystery Science Theater, do you watch any other movie hosts or do you have any favorites such as Up All Night, say, with Rhonda Shear or Gilbert Godfrey or... Or, or even some or of the really old ones like Zachary. Zachary or, or, or anything or like that. Or new ones like Elvira or anything. Um... Yeah, it, uh, uh, I think that had something to do with the show in, in the early days. I, when I was a kid, I used there. I lived in Green Bay, and there was a show on called Erie Street with a guy named Alexander. And I guess when I was a kid, I figured that'd be the only way I could get on TV is by hosting monster movies. And so I think that had something to do with the inception of the show. But you know, part of what we do is. It's so different. I mean, there's really Elvira and the people I've seen, they don't really do what we do with the movies. So I don't really, I guess I don't really pay attention that closely just because it's such a different kind of show. It's totally different. It's, it's totally, totally original. Yeah. I mean, if we just didn't touch the movies, then we'd be more like them. But it's kind of like, you know, it, it's kind of like, it's different. I think of it as differently. I don't. I never really compared myself to those people, but I, I remember when Elvira came out. I was living in L.A. and I used to think, "Oh, that's neat," you know. I thought it was kind of neat. What about you, Trace? Uh, do you base anything that you do on any of the movie hosts? Or um, when I grew up, uh, the local kids show host or wacky sidekick, Roundhouse Rodney, uh, lived in my neighborhood. And so I, I kind of just took it for granted that the people you see on TV uh, are people that live in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could only get so far on my bike, I could only get to his house. So I just assumed that everybody lived just a little bit farther away. But it was kind of neat to have this guy who was this, this really great character as a neighbor. Mm -hmm. He's dead now. When you were a kid, I, I can just imagine you would never envision that you would be the voice of a puppet. Uh, it, it wasn't anything that had occurred to me at the time. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you, Trace, being, uh, being married in that, do you have any kids? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, I was going to, okay. Are you newly married? or? Uh, no, about eight, nine years or something like that. What does your wife think of your show? She likes it. Is she, she a fan? She doesn't get to see it too much because uh -huh. I'm... Uh, 
usually watching Star Trek or something, and uh, I've got control of the cable thing. But no, she watches it uh, Saturday nights here, I think. All right, let me ask you this. Uh, as far as Joel with his face being recognized in grocery stores and you with your voice, because just by listening to you, the voice is very, very recognizable as that of your character. Where with Gilbert Gottfried, if you ever talk to him in person, the voice is totally different than his character or what he does. Do you ever get recognized in stores and shopping and so forth, asking both of you here? Yeah, I do occasionally. What do they say? Uh... They're really, most folks are really nice, and they just say, hi, I like your show, and, uh, um, you know, so it's pretty nice. It's not like they come after me or want anything. Uh, they're real nice, and they see, I think that's what's so nice about our show, kind of having a, like Trey says, it's, they, when they discover it themselves, they treat it a little more special than if it was like a big network show. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of jammed down their throat that this is a big deal. And so our fans were really fond of them. We're, as a group, they're pretty, we think they're pretty great. And, uh, and they're really nice. People don't, uh, people don't make me feel stupid in public or anything. They're real nice and friendly and they, they know when to, you know, they, they just are nice. So it's been a real good experience. So you enjoy getting approached then at times, or? Uh, well, it's kind of like a necessary evil, you know, it's kind of like, it comes with the territory. I don't, I guess I don't enjoy it, it makes me kind of self-conscious, but yeah. at least the people who come up are nice. Especially if you ever run into a situation of the one reason why Paul Newman never gives autographs, he was asked to give an autograph one time while he uh, was standing at a urinal. Oh, really? Yeah, that could be a little bit bothersome. What about you, Trace? You, you ever... initial it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about you, Trace? you ever get recognized for your voice in that? Uh, not really. Uh, people don't make the connection. I look completely different than the scientist, and so I don't get recognized yeah. that much. Uh, people that I've known for a long time are just now getting it yeah. that I'm on this show, which is cool. I've... Yeah. I was sitting in a, a restaurant the other night listening to people talk about the show, and I could be kind of a mouse in the corner and listen to them, uh, listen to the man on the street and mm -hmm. what his opinion is. How much different do you look than Dr. Clayton Forrester? Um, I'm shorter, <laughs> and I, my eyes aren't blackened in. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I'm pretty much the same. Are those your real glasses? No, no, those are... <laughs> Uh, I don't know where those came from. <laughs> Do you wear glasses at all in real life? or? No, not at all. Okay. And how would you describe yourself, Joel, as compared to Joel Robinson? How different are you? How alike are you? Well, um, I don't know. I, uh, uh, I don't know. I kind of, it's, it's the way I act in, when I'm on stage or on TV. Uh-huh. <clears throat> uh, uh, I'd like to think I'm more dimensional. Yeah. than Joel Robinson, uh, but uh, I think he's probably got, I have a shorter temper than Joel Robinson does. Joel Robinson is a lot more uh, uh, paternal, mm -hmm. maybe, than I am. Uh, but, you know, it, it's really hard for me to say. I'm different, though. Do you think that something would work like this on, let's say, uh, a home video market uh, as compared to being broadcast over network television every day. Perhaps even MSD the movie someday. Could that ever come about? That's possible. We're working on it. We've already written a movie. Is there anything you can say about it or is it all real secret? Um, I guess you could say we're working on it. <laughs> okay, would it be the same type of format to where you would be uh, talking in front of a movie, or would that only be in selected scenes and be mostly story involved with you guys? Uh, no, it would be a lot like the show is. Okay. Great, I'm glad you told me that. That's, that's a good piece of information there. Yeah. There's one Tell thing I have buddy. to ask you. I don't know if I'm going to be able to print this or not, but uh, do you know Gilbert Gottfried at all, Joel? Yeah. And you know him pretty well personally, or...? Um, I don't know, I gave him a ride home once from the club, and I ran into him once backstage at a concert. Uh-huh. So I just have, uh, met him a few times.
times, hung out with him a little bit. I asked him to comment on other movie show hosts. And he started off, first of all, saying, well, there's nobody better than me. You know, it was, you know, he was funny all the way through it. He wasn't trying to be smart or nothing. It was his funny way of saying things. And I said, well, now, Gilbert, I want you to say something nice because I'm going to tell Joe exactly what you think about him. He says, okay, tell Joel that I think he's incredibly sexy and I want him to have my baby. Yeah. Yeah, um, he's a gr- if you ever get a chance, he's really good live. He's a gr- yeah. He's really brilliant. It's very hard to do a straight interview with him. Everything is, is really... Definitely. <laughs> one of the wackiest things that we ever conducted. It was really something. Crazy. Yes. Well, I thank you so very much for talking to us. Let yeah, me, uh, well, uh, make sure you send us a copy if it gets done. Absolutely. Okay, let me, uh, real quick, Joel and Trace, while you're there, um, and that, speaking of the story in that, we will probably uh, have the chance to mention some of the MT or MST uh, merchandise in your catalog and things like that. I was wanting to find out if it might be a possibility that we could have sent to us a 8x10 photograph with each and every one of you guys autographed on it and also about three t-shirts from Mystery Science Theater. Uh, yeah, let's, you know what you should do is call back and talk to Jan, uh, Jan Johnson. Okay. Jan Johnson, she runs the fan club. Okay. Because we'd have to go and set that up with her, so I'll go tell her you'll be calling. Okay, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate talking to you. And we will be sending that copy to you. Great. And thank you, Trace. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.